It's been said that everybody's got a story to tell. Well, the person we're uh, about to meet tonight, there's no group of people in America more prepared to argue their constitutional rights. That's how we connect yeah. to yeah. each other. That's how we connect to yeah. our communities. And that's what we tried to do here yes. at the cafe. From the Scripps Howard School of Journalism and Communications on the campus of Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia, I'm Earl Caldwell, and the Caldwell Cafe is on the air. Well, this afternoon, it's Malcolm X that has the attention of so many across the country. 55 years ago, Malcolm was assassinated in the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem, New York. From that day until this day, it is still a question, an unanswered question, who assassinated Malcolm X? One of those who witnessed the assassination was Peter Bailey. Peter is, was a uh, close confidant of Malcolm X. He was his communications director. He was with Malcolm that day, standing in the wings as the assassin struck. He was one of the pallbearers who would carry Malcolm to his grave. Peter has been writing, reading, and uh, he isn't just about to come out with a new book and maybe another uh, month on the assassination and the life of Malcolm X. He joins us now from his home in Washington, D.C. Peter, nice to have you back at Hampton. Yeah. The Manhattan District Attorney from uh, out of nowhere has thrown uh, a hard ball in the assassination uh, with regards to the assassination of Malcolm. He says those who are in prison who have been serving time, one still and one now deceased, they were they they, they they didn't do it. They've thrown out that thrown that all out, and now we're back at square one. Peter, what do you make of this? Earl, uh, I will say this. Uh, first of all, I, I was really not the director of communications, with brother. I just want to make it that clear. I was the editor of the newsletter. Uh, we had a newsletter with the OAAU, and I was the editor of the newsletter. I I was not uh, you know the director of communications. I stand corrected. Uh, and and um, I would basically say that I I think the question about that like uh, who killed Malcolm X first of all if I was writing that I would always use the word who assassinated you know rather than who killed because assassin who assassinated puts it immediately into some kind of you know political context uh, that would always be my question in something like that but I. Uh, to me, I've, as a person who was there, who was a founding member of the OEAU, who uh, spoke to Brother Malcolm that Sunday afternoon, in fact, was backstage talking to him about a couple of things, and who was in the Audubon and heard the shots, and who ran up and jumped him on the stage after the shooting stopped and saw Brother Malcolm uh, with, with bullet holes in, you know, in, his, in his upper body. I actually saw them, he was gasping. I have never believed that the, 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 uh, uh, the two, at those times, uh, Thomas 3X Butler and, and uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't, Butler and Johnson, I'll call them, yes. uh, were uh, involved in the assassination. And I say that because one of the brothers uh, uh, named Brother Earl Grant, who was one of Brother Malcolm's most trusted and perceptive advisors, told me within a, you know, a day or two after the assassination that it is no way that those two members of the, of the Harlem Mosque could have been in that ballroom and part of an assassination chip on Brother Malcolm because Brother, our, Brother Malcolm's people who had left the nation with him would have recognized them. So from that day forward, I never believed that, that, that those two were involved in the assassination. I knew that they had an intense dislike for Brother Malcolm. They supported the assassination. 
uh, like many of the people who were members of the Nation of Islam at that time, they supported it, uh, but they were not directly involved. And, and then um, that was confirmed for me in 1993, when I read a book by uh, uh, Baba Zach Kondo called Conspiracies Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X. And to me, that is a definitive book on this subject. And in that book published in 1993, Zach named the five guys by name who were the actual assassins. And so for them to act as though, you know, this is some kind of new thing and they discover something new uh, around, the, around that, you know, the assassination to me is, 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 is at best misinformation uh, and at worst an absolute lie. Peter, what what uh, do you believe that was motivating the Manhattan District Attorney to take this action at this point? I think you know it, it's a good thing. It gave him a name, gave him something you know uh, that was that 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 they considered important. Uh, to me, it's almost like another every now and then this this government. Of, of, of people in this country sometimes, of people in positions, they give us like feel good type things. You know, in fact, I predicted in my column that I have written that probably 20, 25 years from now, this exoneration is gonna probably be taught in high schools and colleges as a shining example of how American justice works. Yes, 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 yes. Peter, it's also been said in this light of what's happened the last uh, couple of days that uh, uh, crucial evidence was withheld in New York by police law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And also that uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover uh, indicated that uh, there were uh, FBI informants present in the Audubon ballroom at the time, at the time of the assassination, uh, those two things do, does that uh, does that uh, mean anything to you? Not real. Again, this is all. This is nothing new. Zach said all of this stuff way back in 1993, and and I was in the Audubon that day. I was not in the main ballroom. I was, you know, the entrance. I don't know, Earl. You've probably been to the Audubon, but the, the entrance is like a small lobby area. And I was sitting in the small lobby area, uh, and uh, I get, when I came in, when I came to the, to the place that Sunday, uh, when Brother Malcolm came in, he said to me, "Peter, uh, come backstage. I want to. I got something I want to talk to you about." So I said, "Okay," and I went backstage. And and Earl, to me, this is a classic example of what kind of a person this brother was. The day before, February the twentieth, I had written a newsletter, uh, basically saying that despite everything that's going down. Our support for Brother Malcolm is still you know, strong and that kind of thing. Uh, two weeks before then, he had been banned from France. The weekend before, his home had been firebombed and, and, and putting himself and his family in danger. And so I kind of wrote a newsletter saying that, you know, we, and when I showed it, and that Saturday, February 20th, when Brother Malcolm came to our offices in the Hotel Teresa, I showed it to him. And I don't know what I said in it to this day, but he said, Brother Peter, I, I, I would uh, hope you don't, you cannot distribute this. Uh, so I said, okay, and I put it away. And I, and I did that without even questioning it because in the very first issue of the newsletter and when the Harlem uprising occurred in 1964, I had written a, my first article in the first newsletter and I said, eyewitnesses to the murder and Brother Malcolm stopped me. And he said, Brother Peter, you can't use the word murder or murder because those are legal terms. You can use only have he's been convicted. And he say, and if you call him that and he's, and he's acquitted and we know he's gonna be acquitted, you no, know, he can sue. He said, call him a killer, refer to it as a killing because he's a killer and it's a killing no matter what the circumstance. So from that experience and, and other things, I knew right away, this brother knew you know, this, this whole situation, how that situation worked. So I just put those things off to the side. I never know what happened to him, never saw them again. But I, I always, when I speak there, I said, now here this brother is under all this pressure. When I went backstage that's on the 21st, and see his request, you know what he said to me? Brother Peter, I know you put a lot of work in that, in that uh, news release that you wrote. I hope you understand why I asked you to not distribute it. Now here's this brother under all this pressure and he's concerned about my feelings. Wow. Please. And so 
I told him, I said, no, I understand. And then I showed him an article. Uh, I, it was the first time I'd ever seen an article on the Deacons for Defense and Justice. And I had clipped it out of the papers and I showed it to him and he read it and he said, that's good. That's good self-defense. That's, self, that's just, we need self-defense. That's been the way he described that. And I was back there about four of them. We talked for a few minutes. And then he said, uh, does anyone uh, recognize that there was, a, there was a pastor who was to come to the, our, our meeting that day to raise, ask for funds, raising for this clothing for his children. Everything had been burned up in the firebombing. And so I said, well, I know what he looks like. He said, but well, go out front and bring him backstage when he comes in. So I was out in the little lobby area sitting facing the door when he, uh, uh, and, and, and off to the right was the office. And Earl, in that office, I saw two police. I saw two New York City, New York City policemen in that office. It was not a big office. And then that was the bathroom to the side. After I'd been out there about maybe, maybe 10 minutes at the most, I heard Brother Malcolm say, "Assalamu alaikum. Next thing I heard were the shots. Peter, almost always at the uh, Nation of Islam events, there's mm -hmm. bodyguards and searches of people. Uh, that kind of security wasn't taking place back then? Right. And, and we, first of all, uh, Brother, Malcolm's, Brother Malcolm had security when he was moving around. But he, his, he did not want that kind of thing at our rallies because he said that turns people off and makes people nervous about coming to our rallies. And we want to get, you know, large numbers of people coming to our rallies. And if everybody's being searched and know they're going to be searched, then that makes people afraid to come to our rally. So he vetoed it. In fact, that the Tuesday before that Sunday, the security brothers had called a meeting and called the men in the OAAU to the meeting. I, I went to the meeting and they told us, we're searching everybody coming in Sunday. And we, our position was, hey, go at it. But the Malcolm vetoed it. Because because of what he said, he said we don't want to make people you know nervous and things by coming to our rallies because everybody going to be searched. Now he he had security when he was moving around, but he didn't want it done at the rallies that we had at the Audubon on Sunday, and so that's why uh, those they, you know they were not searched. And 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 when uh, but one brother uh, had brought his pistol with him, and he was able to shoot one of the assassins in the leg, and he got caught and and. And I think that threw that whole game off. If that guy had gotten away, I would believe, till I'm out of here, Earl, that if Hare had gotten away, there never would have been a trial. Wow. Once he was shot and caught, then they had to do something very quickly. So they ran yeah. out and picked up these two members of the Nation of Islam and, uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, and, and accused them of doing it. And they never, and they stopped right there. Everybody had told them there were five people involved, the two who caused the disturbance, they gathered everybody's attention and the three who did the shooting. But once they picked those two guys up, that, that's, that's it. You know, so, you know, from the very, those of us who were involved with Brother Man, from the very beginning, we, you know, we questioned the way. When I was called in for questioning uh, by the New York City police, most of the questions they asked me would seem to me to be designed to find out if I was believing the story they were putting out. Mm. You know, they, they didn't really seem to be trying to find out, ask somebody who, who did it? They were trying to find out whether I was believing what they were saying that you know they had these three guys picked up and done it. So I had, I never for a moment uh, because of, of my listening to and knowing uh, Brother Earl Grant, who was very close to Brother Malcolm, one of his most trusted and perceptive. He had already told me that there's no way those two guys were involved. And so so then in 1993, uh, when I read Zach Condo's book, and now like I say, that's a detailed account of what happened. And so. This, this uh, exoneration to me was like, again, it neither shocked me nor surprised me. You know, I'm just feel as though they, 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 they put those two guys up for, or had them in, under this thing for like oh, what, almost going on 56 years when they knew from the beginning that they were not involved. But does this put pressure on uh, law enforcement to open, reopen some sort of investigation or is it, is it too late now? Is this the end? I, I, I doubt if they are going to reopen anything. I, and they may, but I, I doubt it very seriously. And like I said, what they will be doing is teaching this in 20, 25 years now is a yeah. shining example of American justice. I don't well, believe that, uh, that they are going to go any, you know, because like I said, it's already known. Yeah. It is known who were those five assassins. 
Zach and that's been, and that, and that and that's been out there since 1993. 1993, Zach named them. At the time he wrote it, he wrote his book, Conspiracies Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X. Two of them had died. Is this book still out in print? Uh, yes. I think you have a, you, uh, I talked to Zach last May. We had a program last May uh, uh, celebrating what would have been Brother Malcolm's birthday. And uh, I talked to Zach and he told me that he is updating his book. So he's working on that now. But I think you have, it's, 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 it's difficult to find. You may, you, you may be able to find it, you know, on, on, you know, on one of those online uh, type programs. But it is, it is an absolute, man, it is a great book, man. It details, it, it, I mean, and to me, it's like the book on the assassination. And most importantly, it named the five guys. Who, who, are they, uh, who the author again, what is his name? His name is, his, his, on his book, it says Baba Zach A. Kondo. And at what the time, is his background? At the time he wrote the book, Zach was a professor at Bowie State. I think it was then Bowie State College. It's now Bowie State University. And How he, would he get that kind of information? Because he, he did research. He, he did research, man. And he, he, uh, he had, he had uh, uh, by this time, of course, you know, this is what, 65 and... Uh, 93, what's that, 28 years later? Yeah, yeah. Some of that stuff, you know, if you, if you had the, 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 the per type person who, could, who knew how to go and find stuff and dig into stuff, you could get it. And by that time, they were releasing some of the stuff. And he was gotten, and he was putting all this, and it just laid it out, man. He laid it out. I'm telling you, he laid it out. And, 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 it just, and as I said, it reinforced what I had always believed. I never believed that those two were involved in the assassination. So when you look at what the Manhattan DA did, in your mind, it doesn't mean anything. I, as I said before, it's going to be another one of those feel-good things, and yeah. it's going to be taught as a shining example of how the American justice works. But I don't believe that they're going to find very much new that's not already out there, besides in Zach's book, uh, in, the, in, in the FBI files, and, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, I came across a quote in a book by a British writer named Anthony Summers, a book called Official and Secret, Official and Secret, the, the uh, Official and Confidential, The Secret Life of J. Edgar Hoover. In that book, which is almost 500 pages, he mentions Brother Malcolm one time in that entire book. But that, the one time he has J. Edgar Hoover saying to Senator Lyndon Johnson, now, if it was Senator Lyndon Johnson, that means that it happened before 1960, because Johnson became vice president in 1960. But he quotes in that book, in that one mention of Brother Malcolm, he quotes him, Hoover as saying to Johnson, quote, we wouldn't have any problem if we could get those two guys fighting, we could get them to kill one another off, end of quote. Those two guys were Brother Malcolm and Dr. King. And then in the COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program that the FBI had set up, and which became very prominent sometimes after the assassination of Brother Malcolm and, and before the assassination of Dr. King, uh, one of the things says that the goal of COINTELPRO was to prevent the rise of a black messiah who could unify and electrify the black nationalist type organized, you know, people in black people in this country, that Malcolm X might have been able to do so. And of course they they, they know. They, they, I don't know why they say Mike, because they knew that they feared that that's why he was assassinated. If right. they just say Mike, they would have been on it, but they felt that brother, I, my position that they knew that Brother Malcolm would be able to do that. Have, have, have the FBI files involving Malcolm X been released? Yes, I got a, I got a, a set, I guess, it's sometime in the I didn't have the patience to hook you, you know, to tap dance, which would do to get them. But somebody got them and then and made a copy of them for me. They're going to be included. Was there, any, was there, was there anything in those files that you found uh, uh, stunning, alarming? Uh, uh... Not really. It was just what, you know, 
they were following everything. They were printing the editorials from the, from the newsletter. They were commenting on what he was doing in Africa. Uh, they were, see, what was clear to understand, Earl, is this. Brother Malcolm had an international agenda. And that international agenda was to take the United States government before the UN Commission on Human Rights for being either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of black people in this country. Now, if but that period between 1955 and 1965, some horrific things were going on. The right. killing, the, the, the assassination of Medgar Evers, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer being beaten in, in, down in Mississippi. Uh, I mean, that was some horrific thing, uh, the bombing of the church in Birmingham. That period was some, some, some really, and so the United States uh, and being involved in, in, a, in a propaganda war with, uh, with Russia uh, uh, was very nervous about somebody talking about taking them before the UN Commission on Human Rights. And it's important to note that the United States had not signed the charter, the UN Charter on Human Rights. I don't know if they've signed it to this day, but they definitely had not signed it at that time. And that meant that in, Brother Malcolm could not take our case to the UN himself. He had to get a UN member to take the case to the commission. And that's one of the reasons why the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which he, which he founded after he left the secular organization, we always called ourselves a human rights organization, not a civil rights organization, because human rights was the international term. Peter, you were uh, you uh, are just finishing, am I right, a, 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 a new book? I'm working on a book right now, and I'm focusing solely on what he was doing internationally. And oh. I mean, and, and I've got, I've got, I've got, I'm going to include uh, material that shows the uh, the depth of of the concern of uh, members of the U.S. The State Department, the CIA, about about Brother Malcolm uh, when he was in Africa in uh, in May 1964. He had, Earl he had audiences, not see you at a reception, shake hands in five minutes, and keep on moving. He had audiences ranging from one and a half hours to three hours with President Nasser of Egypt. President Nzikwe of, Niger of Nigeria, President Nkrumah of Ghana, President Nyeri of Tanzania, President Kenyatta of Kenya, uh, President uh, Toure of Guinea, and Prime Minister Oboto of, of, uh, of Uganda. He had audiences. And then as after, a after result of that, he was then invited to the OAU conference as an observer, not a participant, but as an observer, where he distributed an eight-page document outlining to the African Africans the, the, the importance of a connection between uh, people of African descent in North America and, and African people on the continent. And, uh, and he was moving on this, man. He was moving on this, this whole yeah. goal of taking the United States government before the UN Commission on Human Rights. That's always been a no for Black Americans. Oh, yeah. No reaching out to Africa. I remember uh, reading of uh, Adam Clayton Powell going to the Baghdad Conference, and uh, even the president was saying no. And yeah. they were. Uh, very alarmed. And so I, when Malcolm came, I could imagine that that would have really been. Only, these, these leaders gave him audiences of one and a half to three hours. And then when at the UN debate over the Congo in 1964, the ambassadors from Ghana and Guinea basically said, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, the United States has the right, United States, England, and I think it was United States, Belgium, and, and, and uh, Great Britain had gone into the Congo saying they had to save these nuns uh, from the, you know, from the African, you know, Paris Lumumba and the African uh, 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 liberators. And, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the UN ambassador from Ghana and from Guinea, when they made their speeches at the UN around this case, both of them said, to some degree, if black, if the United States government has the right to intervene in the Congo to save those white nuns, who to say that we don't have the right to, to try to help the black people who are being brutalized in Mississippi? Wow. And they did Man. that as a direct, they did that as a direct result of Brother Malcolm. Wow. Made that yeah. That, That's never the kind of thing. That, that is the kind of thing though that brings him into a very dangerous situation. And you know what was going on in Mississippi at that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Peter, I'm so uh, pleased that you would take time today and uh, join us. 
and uh, uh, when as in listening to, uh, to your analysis, uh, uh, what is happening today? What is happening with this whole action by the uh, uh, authorities in New York? As you say, is it's down the road? This yeah. will be held up as the fairness, the justice. Shining example of American justice. Yes, yes. Peter, <laughs> thank you so much. It's so great to talk to with you again. And uh, I wish you well on your new book. And I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Earl. And I wish you well, too, man. The book and, if you, and if you have a last word, we'd love to hear that, too. Uh, I just want to say that uh, Brother Malcolm was, I always tell, when I speak to young people about Brother Malcolm, I always described him as a great uh, human being, a great black man, a great Pan-Africanist, and a master teacher. And that's Thanks. the way I see him. Thank you so much, Peter. Appreciate Thank it. You. Okay. Thank you. All the best in your new book, too. Thank you very much. All right. Take care.